for, for plebs, by plebs, dropping the Bitcoin only signal. Pleb underground. Welcome everyone to the Pleb Underground. Welcome back, everyone. Episode 96 of the Pleb Underground Weekly Show. I'm your host, Coin Icarus. Walton is at the Bitcoin 2024 conference. So it is just going to be you, me, and our very special guest, longtime Bitcoiner, founder of Synonym and BitKit Wallet, John Carvalho. John, it is absolutely awesome to have you join me on the Pleb Underground. Great to have you on the show. I'm excited to talk about Synonym. I'm excited to talk about BitKit Wallet and a few other spicy things that are going on in the space right now, man. Uh, very happy to be here and, you know, always happy to give my opinion on anything. So here we go. Sweet. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure it's going to I'm sure it's going to piss some people off, but it, hopefully it makes people it, it also makes people think. Anyways, before we dive into the uh, before we dive into the main conversation with you, we are going to take a look at the numbers. The numbers, of course, brought to you by Time Chain Stats and Time Chain Calendars. At the time of this recording, the block height is eight hundred fifty-four thousand fifty-eight. The Bitcoin fiat exchange sixty-seven thousand four hundred forty-two and change. Ah, uh, the Big Macs, Big Macs per BTC. Look at this, guys. Look at this. We're over 12K. You're getting a lot of Big Macs, a lot of Big Macs. 13,094 total public lightning capacity, 5,303 fastest fee. That's right. That's right. The ordinal enjoyers and the runes enjoyers in disbelief. Six sats per V byte, Moscow time, 1482. Boom, the numbers. This episode of Pleb Underground is brought to you by CypherSafe. Check them out at cyphersafe.io. Pet rock enjoyers in disbelief. That's right. The Bitcoin Relo Triangle. 16 ounces of solid titanium. Beautiful craftsmanship. Check it out. It is absolutely a wonderful piece by cyphersafe.io. And that is the Bitcoin Relo Triangle. John, I know that that uh, I know that that was a very thrilling uh, beginning to the show right there. The numbers. Uh, any thought? Well, I hadn't seen thoughts? the Big Mac index. Oh. so I like that. Yeah. <laughs> See, right. All of a sudden, you're, you know, you're getting kind of bullish on McDonald's. You know, it's like, why not? <laughs> Even though it's crap, well, I'll eat it. <laughs> I'm getting a lot more of it. <laughs> anyways, anyways, I just like pricing anything but but dollars. You know, it's interesting. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, I totally agree. I totally agree. Well, another metric that I like is the uh, the home prices one. Right. Like when they when they show you how much, you know, essentially the decreasing amount of Bitcoin that it costs. Yeah. So uh, all the, the OG Bitcoiners can cry about the home they didn't buy and the Bitcoin <laughs> they sold when it was two hundred dollars. Uh, you know what? To your point, though, to your point, it, it always makes me think how many of those people so early on really did hodl. Right. Like, I think it was actually harder. I might be wrong, but man, you'll correct me. Like, I think it was actually I think it was harder to hodl back then than it is today for some. I think so too. It, right? People like every time people ask me, how, like, oh, tell me your Bitcoin story. And then I say, well, I've been in Bitcoin for 11 years. And like immediately I'm like, I'm thinking, okay, they probably think I'm like filthy rich. But what people don't understand is that the amount, the quantity of people that actually held tight back then was really low. You, you kind of had to already be a little bit well off or at least have a decent amount of savings that you were willing to put at great risk um back then and then you had to hold hodl through like you know watching like i don't know i i started buying bitcoin and it was like 10 11 dollars and then i saw it go to 100 and 250 like you think i'm not gonna sell like you know like i, I back then like i still had like loans and debts and mortgages and like you you it's so hard to hold unless you're already an investor so people like winklevoss twins yeah they had a lot of money to throw in early you know extra money and so they were able to kind of make that exponential gain and and there are some others like max kaiser and people like this but i think the quantity of people from back then that actually held to the point of being like millionaires or multi-millionaires or even billionaires is pretty small percentage you know what? I think that this would be helpful because there are a lot of newer Bitcoiners that that watch this show, and I I just want to get an idea. Like, what was the uh, what was the feeling back then in terms of maybe the feeling's the wrong word? Okay, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna backtrack that. What was the narrative? 
like back when you started? Because for I could tell you for me, when I came to Bitcoin in, in late 2015, for, for me, the narrative was medium of exchange. I didn't really get the whole hodling thing yet. I understood that the Bitcoin fiat exchange, right, was going up. Like I could see that, you know, like my Bitcoin was becoming more valuable in terms of purchasing power, but it didn't, for me, it was still just like, well, it's internet money and, and I'm using it on the internet. Like what was, what was kind of like the predominant narrative back then when you first started, if you recall? I mean, it goes in phases, right? So like when I first got in, I got in because I heard about the Silk Road and people using this thing called Bitcoin to buy drugs online. And I wanted to see if it was true. And so I bought some Bitcoin and bought some drugs on Silk Road. And that was like a very mind expanding experience. <laughs> I don't mean because of the drugs. <laughs> I guess I set myself up there. But in that, like to see that like this was possible and then try to figure out how it was possible. And, you know, I, after buying weed a couple of times on Silk Road, I was, I was too scared. And that was a little more of the narrative back then was just kind of being a little scared that people were going to find out that you were a Bitcoiner. So back then I didn't use my real name. It took me a while to start using my real name. Name. So that was part of the narrative. We had a lot of the same narratives, but they were more like, instead of having like a religion of people, a group of influencers that believed certain, you know, things about Bitcoin, like number go up or any type of specific thing. It was more like there was a post on you know, the Bitcoin forum that everybody knew about that talked about this. So when they had when a new person had that idea, you'd go and send them to read the discussion that already happened. It wasn't like oh, you must believe this idea or you're not part of the Bitcoin religion and you're not pure. It was more like, oh, like people disagree with that. You can read about it here. And so it was just less intense. Um, we kind of had the first like generation of shit coins before they were shitty. Like, mm. I don't mean that to say that shit coins are great so much as they were innocent, you know, like things like Litecoin and things like this. Um, they weren't trying to scam. And even though that several existed, the amount of scammery around that was really, really very tiny. And it was more concentrated. I'm ranting now, sorry, but it was more oh. concentrated in we we as Bitcoiners were creating or recreating like this whole like gray stock market instead, kind of mm. like shit coins, but instead they were like shares in Bitcoin projects, like mining projects, people who wanted to buy, like a, start a first mining farm with the first ASICs. And they wanted to like take your money and give you shares in it. And so you had a lot of shares and things. I don't know if how, how old your audience has been, how long they've been in Bitcoin, but you know, things like the NEO and B IPO and the ASIC miner a IPO. And that was like when they were out selling eight, the first First ASIC miners for like 55 Bitcoin each. Um, I don't know. Oh I'm rambling, God. but I could, I could go on no. and on about the stories back then. Yeah. No, but, but you just, so you, you got me thinking, right? Because, so this is something that um, I, I think that a lot of people today kind of end up missing is that it seems as though it's once the Ethereum IPO occurred that the shitcoin narrative really kind of crystallized right into, into what it is. Because if I, um, if I understood correctly, the the narrative way back when, right before before ETH, right? If we're going back to like Litecoin and I think Peer Coin maybe and like Namecoin or something, but they weren't seen as outright scams, more as just kind of experimenting. Like it wasn't like the narrative today where it's like I'm building this thing to be the better Bitcoin, you know, and buy my shit coins. Yeah. I mean, there was a little bit that about a little bit about that, but it was it was still innocent. I don't know how to describe the nuance, but it was definitely a nuance. Like one example I like to bring up is Matt Corallo, Blue Matt, who is like, yeah. you know, a prolific Bitcoin and Lightning engineer. He had a tool, I forgot what it's called now, coin something that was just an app that you could use to like modify and make your own shit coin. And so you basically, the, the degree of shitcoinery back then was like change the block size, change the quantity of coins yes. and, cha and change the block frequency or something like this. And then so Matt would, had an automatic kind of script thing where you put in the parameters and it would spit out a, a kind of Bitcoin D of your configuration and you could have your own shitcoin. And that was how like low controversy it was, was that even, you know, somebody who was a core developer had a little shitcoin toy, you know? <laughs> So it didn't essentially cost anything to make your own shitcoin back then. Ah, I mean, very very <laughs> so the easy. Shitcoiners, you, you could upload your logo, like yeah, you just make your. It had your own splash screen with your logo on it. It was it was pretty easy, and 
people did it. I'm, I'm sure none of the shit coins that were made with that thing lived, but it happened. Yeah. That's funny stuff. I, so I, when I came to it, uh, by the, by the time I came to the space that there was like this website, which I totally don't recall anymore, but essentially you would send them, I think it was like 20 bucks in ETH or something. And, and you would just, you'd, you'd make a shit coin, you know, you'd create one, you'd put in the, like you said, you'd put yeah. in the parameters, you know, you'd hit the button and boom, you know, like you'd have your shit coin with your, you know, you pick your pre-mine and everything. So I was told to that go back a little bit to you now. <laughs> you mentioned like ETH crystallizing the kind of shitcoin mm. cycle, you might say. Yeah. Um, it was always there from the beginning. Like, I, 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 the reason I kind of the reason I brought it up is I was thinking actually yeah. earlier today about how there's just this kind of fractal echo aspect of the Bitcoin cycles, and they just keep repeating but mutating a little bit each time. And so, like, mm. you know, first you had Bitcoin, and then you had like Bitcoin in the kind of Bitcoin stock market with a few shit coins before they were like scammy. And then, yeah, you're right. Once Ethereum, like once Ethereum became a thing, you had people that were like invested in making it a success. And it was also kind of the first block size wars. Um, and not the, not about block size, but it was that like, you know, people like Vitalik wanted to mutate Bitcoin to a greater degree, and they were shut down by the kind of gatekeepers of Bitcoin or, you know, the, the protectors of Bitcoin, if you want to be more positive. Um, and so they started making other things they, so they could go play freely. Um, and every cycle, you kind of get a new iteration of this, where there's some tension about like what people want to do on Bitcoin. And so they get sent elsewhere. And this kind of repackaging of Bitcoin alternatives and narratives that are in contrast to Bitcoin and them trying to basically capture all the ignorant new interest that comes in that cycle. And this happens every time. So to your point, okay, I guess we can just dive into this question now. What are your, because I've, I've been curious, what, what are your thoughts? It, I guess it's like a two-part question. Do you consider Lightning to be a similar type of layer two as like, you know, RSK or fucking stacks or something like that. That's the first part of my question. No, no. Okay. So based on that, so based <laughs> I mean, on I, that, I have what, elaborated a lot on like what I consider to be a layer and things like this. And there, there maybe is room for a little bit of nuance, but generally speaking is mm -hmm. if it has a blockchain, it competes with Bitcoin. That's how I see it. Okay. And therefore it can't be a scaling method. So when you're talking about scaling, you have to talk about scaling what? Because some people think about scaling like the Bitcoin price and they think that's scaling. So they think, oh, anything that I can support that will scale the Bitcoin price or scale Bitcoin liabilities, like people's exposure to Bitcoin IOUs, they mm -hmm. consider that scaling Bitcoin. So you kind of have to start the conversation correctly and like establish definitions with who you're talking to. I, man, I, I agree. And to that point, so what, what are your thoughts now on these quote unquote, new and emerging Bitcoin layer twos. Like I, I'm seeing all of a sudden these, these kind of random known, like there's one company, Mezo or something like that, that's supposedly creating a Bitcoin layer two. Like they essentially, they all think they're building on Bitcoin, but they're all making their own tokens. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's another mutation, right? Like we talked about this fractal mutation that happens yeah. every cycle. It's just that now it's happening some a little bit more in Bitcoin than it used to. And even though, but this isn't really on Bitcoin, but the thing is like, this is why I'm such a stickler with like defining these things and establishing meanings and agreeing on like reasonable ones. Mm -hmm. When you have people like Blockstream who are respected engineers or respected company, et cetera, when they choose to take a, a leap in the, and have a narrative that say that, you know, liquid is a layer on Bitcoin and a scaling method for Bitcoin, even though like when you look at the kind of actual what it's made out of, it's not that very it's not it's not very distinguishable from a shit coin, like in how it actually works. And you might yeah. even argue it's worse than a shit coin in that it's literally a controlled blockchain that is like price fixing its token against bitcoin and so when you when you can get away with that and then you have bitcoiners blessing this behavior and saying oh they always include liquid on the list of layers they always you have more bitcoin builders adding uh -huh. support for liquid not a lot of user traction yet but it could happen someday i don't know um but when you start tolerating these definitions you make room for people to leverage that tolerance and so now you have shitcoiners that are going to come in you have wizard taproot wizards that are going to come in these kinds of people that are more for like finding ways to uh 
play on Bitcoin for, you know, to mm-hmm. give the, a nice term. Um, and now they'll use the same narratives. They'll say, look, we're doing the same thing as liquid. So we're also a layer or we're doing the same thing as, you know, stacks. So we're also a layer. But these things aren't actually layers. They're just kind of like these contraptions that are shit coins that they find some way to be dependent on Bitcoin somehow. So they say they're a layer. And that's really all it is. So to that to that point, let me ask you this. Did you see the announcement from Lightning Labs? that they're officially releasing taproot assets and I, yeah. I saw that there's kind of like that right that that rush to create the you know tether stable coin on lightning what do you what are your thoughts with what are your thoughts with the taproot assets um i have a i haven't have, dug uh, into it deeply yet sorry i didn't mean to yeah i have a unique history with this because oh okay. i don't know if i was the first one but i was certainly the first one to actually make an effort to try to have tokens on Lightning. Um, back when I worked at BitRefill, you know, this was, you know, we were really big into doing Lightning things. I was really big into trying to find like new ways to leverage Lightning within their business model. And I ended up asking the question to some of the guys there at a meetup, a team meetup, like, do we, do you think we could do tokens on Lightning? And they said, yeah, probably, why not? And that just set me ablaze. And that uh, that also turned into me getting RGB refunded again after it kind of died down with this new mission of having RGB for uh, lightning tokens. Um, And I had kind of this vision, but my vision was more around like my experience at BitRefill where I thought that, you know, tokens were a strictly better format for gift cards because it solved various problems like breakage and the fact that a lot of people wanted to resell their gift cards and that was mm-hmm. very dangerous and you could have it if, you, if it was a bare instrument it wouldn't be dangerous you know these kinds of ideas were interesting to me so i was more interested in like the credit side than the 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 securities or the kind of product side of it if that makes sense yeah. um so yeah i i, I and so I went through trying to do RGB with Lightning. I gave up on that. And even though they still continue, um, I then I moved to Omni and Omnibolt, which was which I actually think is the most practical way to do tokens on Lightning. Um, we implemented that and then we stopped and, and, and gutted that out of our app as well um, for basically bootstrapping reasons. We mm-hmm. were previewed the design for um, what was then called CMYK and became taro and then taproot assets um and so we gave feedback on it early on beforehand we didn't design it at all and i don't want to take any kind of special credit so much Mm -hmm. as that we had our finger on the pulse of these things yeah um and then after analysis and after seeing the narratives that they wanted to use for taproot assets or taro as it was back then um I just didn't think the design was sound and what i mean by that Mm. is and, and what i will maintain today is that Working with the Lightning Network, you realize that it's extremely complex and very delicate. And this provides, provides this causes some user experiences that are not very good or very tricky, very inconsistent, things mm. like this. And that is basically the routing of Lightning is basically the worst part of Lightning. It is what makes it work. It's what turns yes. channels into a network. But that that is like the biggest trade-off area. And Taproot Assets is saying, well, instead of making a network that's just for credit and doing, you know, establishing something like this kind of thing, we're going to put it on Lightning and make it dependent on Lightning. But but remember, like we were just coming out of the phase of where people thought Lightning was going to be the next internet and be the rails for everything. And so this is a continuation of that and in in kind of doubling down on that. And so now you're going to have this design, which is, as far as I know, it still works this way, where you have to use an edge node. But when you use an edge node, those edge nodes basically have to be exchanges because you need liquidity to convert the token asset. You know, you need to have a yeah. conversion rate into Bitcoin as it travels through the, through the network. Um, and that means that you can't use tokens that aren't already having a nice order book. And you can't use edge nodes that don't have access to liquidity to take the other side of the trade. And so you're going to create this kind of like wow. basically exchange gateway is probably a, like how I think it's actually going to play out. So uh, in my opinion, what Lightning Labs has done is they've, they're have they creating features to make exchange exchanges as gateways into the Lightning Network so mm-hmm. people can, give, can convert things before they hop in. But I actually feel like the inverse would be more useful. Like I would rather find have a network that didn't have the routing and liquidity issues of Lightning and bridge with that 
and short circuit the you know Bitcoin through a token network or something. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know if that makes sense. I'm kind of building on ideas very quickly here, but um, no, that's hopefully okay. the audience will understand a little bit. But yeah, so what I think about this is just that Taproot Assets is nothing unless Tether decides to go on it. That's the only, that, like until they change the design design of it and make it so it doesn't require liquidity of like order books to be able to convert. They mm-hmm. Basically, you have to have native token channels where only the token moves in the channel. Until they do a design like that, like how Omnibolt worked, they're not going to be able to justify like bootstrapping a new token of any kind. And even USDC is highly regulated. If they go down that route, and make partnership with USDC and try to like, compete with tether on you know to, to bootstrap the the taproot assets network um i think they're going to regret it because everything will be then highly regulated and so they're going to bring more regulation to the network i think edge nodes or exchange gateways will just bring more regulation in general because mm-hmm. regulators aren't going to like that people are doing conversions that people are possibly gaining some privacy by Converting assets, yeah. Um, uh, that that lightning node, some lightning nodes are acting as kind of money services or exchanges. It, it's just going to get really hairy, and so I don't think the design is efficient or sustainable. I don't think the model is legally sustainable, and so I, I just I'm not really paying that much attention to it at this stage. Now, if two years from now you can see that it's obviously gained traction, there's obviously utility for many people there. Maybe I would capitulate because at least it's a Bitcoin compatible way to do this. But I'm skeptical because we have our own ideas about how to properly address peer to peer credit. Um, mm-hmm. I published a kind of, I don't want to call it a paper so much as writing down how I think peer to peer credit should work. Um, called Atomicity. Um, I can give you a link later if you're interested. But yes. basically, a lot of people kept act, asking me, how, oh, you keep complaining, well, tell me, how, how do you think <laughs> it course. should work? And I said, here, here's how I think it should work. <laughs> and maybe we'll build it next year or something like this. But at the moment, I'm just kind of in a holding pattern or anything to do with Bitcoin and trusted credit, like eCash, Fediments, uh, Taro, all, all these things. Sure. I just feel like none of these are the correct approach. Okay, I, I think you hit the nail on the head there. I, I've said this a few times, but I definitely do not have the ability like you do to explain it uh, in that way. But I, I've just, every time I see these things, I say, it's cool, but this isn't it. You know, like I get that we're getting closer. I get that we're trying all these different iterations, right? Like each turn of the Rubik's Cube, we come closer and closer to the final configuration. But, you know, this just, this just isn't it. Um, the second thing I wanted to say was, immediately when you explained the edge node and liquidity and ability to essentially make those conversions, I immediately understood why when they made the announcement of the tarot assets, they, they talked about tether because that that's yeah. exactly it. Right. Like, I think I mean, they understand uh, candidly, exactly what it's just, just has, it's not viable without tether. Like, I don't yeah. know. I, I can't, I don't speak for tether in this regard. Mm. So I don't know if they have plans to do it or not. My guess somewhat educated would be that they need the network in the software to reach a certain stature. In other words, have been battle tested a bit, have a certain amount of user base that's worth, you know, exposing themselves to that network and maybe also requiring a certain feature set of ability to kind of, you know, I don't know if they require the ability to freeze assets or these kinds of things. I don't know. But in the end, like they'll have to totally cater this thing to Tether. Oh, yeah. To- get them to do it. And Tether can't do business with US entities. So it would never be through any formal relationship. It's just going to have to be Tether one day decides to just use it. That's how it is. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna go down just very very for a short period of time go down the conspiracy rabbit hole because you said that Tether isn't allowed to do business with the US. But it's kind of weird though, right? We have like for me, I've always found this strange that they can buy well, they're US. allowed, they just don't yeah. want to. <laughs> okay. Okay. So that, that's what, okay. That's what it is. I'm like, okay. They just, yeah, it's a preference. Um, okay. We're going to switch gears, uh, away from lightning because I want to get into the, the main piece of the, uh, you know, the, the, the conversation, which is, um, synonym, right. Uh, synonym and BitKit wallet. So let, let's start off first with, uh, with synonym. What, what have you, what have you built with synonym? What is synonym? Sure. Am I, so, saying it, am I saying it wrong? <laughs> you're saying person. it correctly. It's just okay. synonym. It's just, just the word. The word that means that the word means other words. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, 
So at Synonym, we're trying to build what we call the atomic economy. And this mm. is just a concept for a post Bitcoin and then the same technology that came with Bitcoin, like post big tech, post big government, post big bank economy. And so we're trying to make a minimum set of software services and protocols that would be required to basically have an entire system that you could opt into to opt out of those that legacy system where you kind of have big tech you know you have the, maybe three to five of the most major websites in the world doing everything right now and you need to like have some way to opt out of that big banks you have bitcoin lightning maybe some new types of credit systems um and then what was that big in big state ways to self-regulate and you know have peer-to-peer -peer economies that don't require oversight or or don't have to be enslaved to oversight and so that's the kind of broad vision is just we're mm -hmm. trying to make what you might call the post hyper bitcoinized economy and we're doing it all through digital expression so product services and uh protocols now um, that means that we have planned multiple products and product and protocols and services within those products that we're kind of developing over years. And so we started with BitKit because mm -hmm. in this economy, we have decided, or in this ecosystem, we've decided that everything will be key based. And basically we, we've looked at how Bitcoin has given people a reason to care about and understand and learn how to hold keys, hold them safely, sign with them, getting into multi-sig, all kinds of things you can do with keys now um it's we think the whole web should be built that way this whole economy should be based on keys and so that's one major thing about it and so obviously if we're trying to build a post hyper, -hyper bitcoinization society we're going to need a keychain and so we started with that's why it's called bitkit it's like your bitcoin toolkit and it will also be your toolkit for other keys as well as we release more products and so that's why bitkit exists and that's where why we started with bitkit and at the moment what bitkit is is it's just a self custodial mobile bitcoin and lightning wallet the mm -hmm. lightning node is in the wallet it's an ldk node um, so you hold the keys mm -hmm. and you have the lightning node in the wallet. It's not a routing node. It's just an endpoint node, but you know, it's still there. So we're not using like cloud-based nodes or things like this, like uh, say green light might be in this kind of thing, which is also interesting. Um, and then finally we have, what we used to have was slash tags. And this is getting into like the stuff that we're doing in peer-to-peer -peer web, but mm -hmm. we've kind of basically dropped the slash tags project because as we iterated on it, it became something new. Um, and so the old code is basically been scrapped, but we will also have what will be the new slash tags kind of ecosystem compatible with BitKit as well. And so there are keys required in that system. And that's why another reason why we have BitKit. We also have Block Tank, which is our LSP. And that's what kind of powers the lightning features in BitKit. So it's our lightning node providing services to the BitKit lightning nodes, you know, routing, liquidity, selling channels to them, this kind of thing. Um, so yeah, that's some of the things that we're doing, at least some of the release things we're doing. We've been in a pseudo stealth mode for about a year now um, where we're building our next product and the, the kind of replacement protocol for slash tags. Um, yeah. Um, any questions about any of that? No, I, I was just, I, man, I was just looking at your, uh, I was just scrolling through your website. And at, so at first, when I first looked through it, I was trying to figure out the, uh, the relationship. And then I, so I understand now is that synonym is essentially the parent right? Like of the, it's, it's kind of like the container of the ecosystem as you build all of this out. And BitKit is going to be the main, um, kind of like the main portal for all of these, for, for not the main portal, the main tool, apps? in other words, or the main tool, because it's, okay. it's just the main, it's just your keychain. Think of it. This okay. Way. So like when you need to do things that are security sensitive with your keys, but still have, but keys that you still need in a hot, or warm place, mm -hmm. um, then BitKit is going to be the place where you can do that. Now, we might have other places where you can manage keys and some of our products as well. Um, for example, like we're in our next product, we're deciding whether to pair it and have another product that goes with it. That's a, uh, kind of like an authenticator kind of app. And that app might also be a keychain. I'm not sure if we'll do that, but it's emerging as a potential appropriate thing to do. Now, when you said that you, uh, and I just want to make sure I understood correctly, you said that um, 
you in in uh, sorry in the product. Let me go back and take a look here. Block tank, I think it is. You're you're essentially you're running your own lightning node on your phone. Is that so? Block tank is synonyms lightning node. It's synonyms basically our, our service okay. node, and so okay. this node has an API into BitKit that connects to BitKit. Mm. So your node in BitKit now has a very well connected high liquidity node that I can connect to by default. You can still connect to other nodes if you okay. want to, but the default user experience in BitKit is basically when you need liquidity, you are getting it from BlockTank. So BlockTank is both our own software and on top of LND nodes mm -hmm. um, to basically make it give it business services. Can you connect it to your own node? Like can, if you have like, oh, can you run bit? Can you use BitKit as like, a remote uh, for your home node? Yeah. No, it's not because the node is inside. So there, there's no remote capabilities. We okay. might do it someday, but I feel like the use case is a little bit niche. Um, and yeah, so, it's more for, it's people, more for a hobbyist. Like Zeus has that covered. I think yeah. um, if yeah. we, if we, if we saw that niche get bigger and we wanted to compete, maybe we would like, I think it's a practical feature to have, but mm -hmm. right now we're, we're more trying to figure out if we can make a wallet that is just the most popular Bitcoin mobile wallet. Um, and I don't know that that is going to get us there more than some yeah. of the other things we're prioritizing. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. I, I think a... But um, you could buy a channel from another LSP, for example, yeah. if you didn't want to buy one from us, and you could just scan the QR code and add that channel to BitKit. Um, but you can't... Uh, yeah, you can't you can't do like the full features that you might if you had a remote node. Um, but yeah, you have you know, Zeus for that, Umbral for that, et cetera. Yeah, so I've I, I've seen you, uh, you know, obviously throughout uh, throughout the years. Like I interviewed you long time ago on my Fun with Bitcoin podcast, and we dove into the whole argument that you had the uh, the famous video, right, with uh, with Roger Ver, and then of course, you know, throughout the years, I've I've always paid attention to your takes on on Twitter, um, and I. Essentially, um, I've noticed that you've been building this for quite a while, and I, I want to know, like, what's been your biggest challenge? Because I don't, I feel like you're, I mean, maybe I, I'm ex explaining it the wrong way. I just don't feel you're, you're like part of like the specific circle jerk. <laughs> like, there's like, I don't know how to explain it because it, it, it's just, I, I don't know. I feel like there's different silos. Right. And I, I feel like sometimes you're off in, in on like an island, so to speak. So I guess so I'm I, you like, I think there's two questions it, in there. There's one. It is, why there is. There's two questions. Guys so long. And two, why does nobody like you? <laughs> I don't know. I, I just I just feel like you're like in, in a silo and that you're like building against, like you're fighting against the current. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Is there um, is like is there any truth to that? I don't know. Um, it's not why I'm doing what I'm doing. In other words, it's not an explanation for my actions so much as a symptom. Yeah. Um, so like, I am not interested in what everybody else thinks for the most part. You know, there are mm -hmm. very few people that I would be influenced by when it comes to how I think Bitcoin should work, how I think, you know, freedom on the web should work, how I think products should behave. Like, I ha I've been doing this for a long time and I've been involved in some related areas since before Bitcoin as far as branding, products, web, et cetera. Some of the ideas within uh, slash tags and the new version of it, things that I've been working on since before Bitcoin. Um, and so uh, I think that if I am going against the grain, as it were, um, and not in my own silo, it's just, an, it's just because I am like focused on have understanding what I want and mm -hmm. making sure that I can ship that. And I'm open to other people saying, Hey, John, what you want is, you know, uh, inferior to this or that. But most of the time, that's not the kind of conversations people want to have. They want to kind of uh, pitch you into their thing, give you mm -hmm. shit for not being supporting the things their tribe supports, et cetera. And so I'm just not a very, I don't want to say the word loyal, but I'm not a very tribal person. And so like I take everything on its on on its current dynamic. I make every decision on the fly, you know, about what is relevant in that moment. And I'll change that decision if the environment changes, if that's appropriate. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of people have trouble with just being that, I don't know, determined for their own vision. 
And so until people will refute my behavior, like in a way that satisfies me, I will continue on this path. And I also see it as like, our company is owned by Tether. And I set it up this way on purpose because I didn't want to be one of those startups going out and fundraising all the time because I would have to make bullshit narratives, bullshit pivots, things like this to be able to keep raising money and just keep scaling this like shrine to my idea mm-hmm. when I could actually just go ahead and say, okay, let me find someone that I think is capable of actually funding this idea that would support this idea and just be loyal to them and stick with them. Mm. and take my time doing this in a way that I think makes sense. And I'll use that as a segue to kind of the the first question you kind of started to ask, which was, I've been doing this for a while. Mm. Um, Like the first year, it was maybe four people. The second year, we maybe got it up to like eight or so, eight to 10 people. And so I, I can't really effectively work and recruit well you know, more than one or two people a month at most. Mm -hmm. And we just, we just learned a lot in that time. So like I told you a little bit already, like how we, we tried to work with RGB. We tried to work with Omnibolt. We completely implemented Omnibolt and then threw that away. Um, We completely implemented L and D mobile and threw that away and then completely implemented LDK. So there's a lot of research around the type of work that we do. So it's like, we're, we're a mix between research and a product company um and that's kind of how we're approaching things and i love that i have this opportunity to do it because normally a startup wouldn't be able to like say oh we're just going to throw away slash tags because you know it's it's we we realized as we worked on it that we needed a different design um but we are able to do that and i don't think we're doing it in a wasteful way so much as we had to make those mistakes in order to get to where we are today and i see it as we're like the cathedral model, like where mm-hmm. we we have a plan, we have a roadmap, we have a budget, we have a leader, we have a vision. We we know what we're doing, and we're just trying to get you know walk walk that path. Whereas like maybe something like Noster or other open source projects are more like this you know bizarre model where they have they can they have an advantage of competing on quantity and mutation, but not on focus. You know what I mean? And not on responsibility and these kinds of things. So we're just trying to be the best at what we do. We have mm-hmm. we have had to learn some things um, along the way, but I'm feeling really good right now. Like we're at 21 people in the team and like some of the people like are really getting like in, into the vision. Yeah, it's a good number to stop for a while. <laughs> I hope you stop for a while because recruiting is a pretty big distraction sometimes. Um, but yeah, we just feel like a unit and we feel like we have multiple sub teams that are kind of all working towards different goals we're doing like a native rewrite of bitkit we're working on the new app we're preparing for like an internal hack week using the tools for the new protocol we're doing a soft launch of the new app next month like we've got a lot going on we're doing the release of the of the beta of the new app in october um yeah so it's i don't know if that rant answers all your questions but no it does and it actually leads me to my my next one, which is what has been your your biggest challenge in in doing um I, I guess I, I was gonna ask you just specifically for synonym, but now that I understand a whole lot more about how every piece works, I guess it could just be what you know, what's been your biggest challenge of this entire project? Like if I can you quickly if you could say find two one things most painful. I don't know points. which one is bigger, um, but I can quickly say <laughs> you two, can pick things, two which is <laughs> um, lightning in general, um, yeah. just lightning in general on mobile, uh, navigating the nuances of different implementations, op- options for implementing on mobile, um, and then dealing with the inconsistencies while interacting across implementations, um, being a little early in implementing LDK. So that's really having to like we implement had to implement a lot ourselves and now finally they have their own ldk node that makes it easier to implement but that didn't exist when we started um so just lightning in general has been the hardest part you've probably seen me complaining a lot about lightning in general like i still think it's the best risky thing to work on for bitcoin yeah. but because but it's because we don't have something better like it's not because i think lightning is perfect it's that it's just some it's just worth it it seems worth it still mm. um but yeah lightning has been a big big uh drain 
to try to get to the point where we are, um, to get it stable, to get payments working most of the time, just to get it not crashing, not making sure people won't lose money or lose channels. It's been a real pain in the ass. Um, I have a much more realistic view of lightning than I did in 2018 when I was telling everybody like, be reckless. Lightning is ready now. Let's go. Like me too. (laughs) Super enthusiastic. And now I've I've come back. The other one is, as you heard of my description of our vision and what synonym is, Mm -hmm. we have a wide scope and trying, I'm intentionally trying to be good at running a company that's doing more than one thing at a time. I've had a lot of advice since the beginning. I remember I had a call with Sailor early on and he said to me, like, just focus on the Tether thing. We were were thinking about doing, we were working on Omnibolt and that, you know, so Tether could be tokens Mm -hmm. on lightning and, uh, and, you know, uh, other people giving me advice to just focus on one thing, just only do BitKit, just only do the token thing in BitKit. Um, But I, that I, I feel like if I'm going to respect the opportunity I have, I'm going to try to actually be good at having multiple teams, multiple products, you know, concurrently, because that's what I want to become good at. And so that's been mm-hmm. the hard part. That's never been another part of what's taking more time is to some degree, those people are right. Like if you just focus on one thing, you will ship that one thing faster. Yeah. Your other things, maybe even your other things might ship faster because you're, you're focusing on one thing at a time and doing a sequence, but that's not what I want. I want a scaled thing. I want to be able to say, you know, we have the best people that are working on peer-to-peer web problems and products. We have the best people that are working on, you know, mobile Bitcoin and lightning and products. Like I want to be able to just have that whole stature of that whole ability to say, look, when we when when synonym wants to step in and solve a problem for digital freedom we have like a range of teams that can accomplish that and i want to continue to do research and ship new products perpetually and so that's what i'm trying to build very nice very very nice um since you just mentioned sailor i am going to i'm going to ask you now uh because i i did see that uh, at the Bitcoin conference, uh, Saylor did make a comment, right? He said, the US government should own the majority of the Bitcoin in the world. And I just wanna know what your what your thoughts are on that. I, you know, but personally, I, I never really look at Bitcoin in terms of countries just because I, from the way that I learned about Bitcoin, for me, it's just, you know, it's for, you know, it's for anyone, but not, or sorry, it's for everyone, but not anyone, right? It's just like, if you, you know, if you desire to use Bitcoin, you desire to interact with it, then so be it, but that's it. I've never really seen it as something uh, that should be predominantly, um, I don't even know how to explain that because, you know, controlled or owned by one specific entity and what that would bring. So I'd love to know what your thoughts are. Well, disclaiming that I don't have the context and, you know, I don't know oh, that do I think I. the context would change much, <laughs> neither do um, I. but That's all I, have is the I know he loves speaking in metaphors and this kind of thing. <laughs> and so the context might even be hard to determine because I, I just have a real problem with metaphors. Yeah. Um, but I, I disagree, you know, on the surface, I would say one, um, decentralization matters in every dimension. And so Mm -hmm. if you have too much concentration of Bitcoin wealth, that actually will express in negative centralization symptoms as well. Um, And this is very kind of abstract and just thinking about the primitives of Bitcoin and the dynamics between things. But yeah, Mm -hmm. I, I really firmly believe that you want as many people as possible owning Bitcoin as well, if you care about decentralization and think that helps Bitcoin's health. Now, all of society is a ladder. So you're always going to have somebody with the most Bitcoin and that, you know, so you can't like, you can't say he's crazy because maybe he's just saying, I think America should be the one with most Bitcoin. Now, if he thinks they should own all the Bitcoin or like the super majority of Bitcoin, that kind of makes everybody like a slave to, you know, the liquidity of America, because now Hmm. if America wants to like sell a lot of Bitcoin, everybody else would be, you know, severely affected for a very short period. Um, and then America will be fine because the, you know, the volatility moving, you know, a few percentage points because of their sale doesn't affect them because they hold most of it anyway. I don't know that, I don't know enough about economics to say whether it could ever even play out that way, honestly, mm. but I, I'll pivot to another perspective, which is 
I don't really want the government involved. I want the government involved in Bitcoin as late as possible. Like, yes. I just don't, I don't think there's any like yeah. good thing that comes from baking in the government early. And even now, like having like Trump on stage at a Bitcoin conference and, you know, Winklevoss twins yelling at Kamala for not attending the Bitcoin conference. Like this is just, even for the, the years you know, the last few years, we've kind of had this Austin, Austin, Texas Bitcoin movement as well. They've been kind of a little bit more politically aligned to Bitcoiners as well. I don't think anything good is going to come from this or has come from this. With one exception, I have seen some states um, add Bitcoin rights, like yeah. the right to hold Bitcoin yourself, things like this. That I think is interesting because rights are more, much more interesting than regulation because rights are things that the government has to defend your use of doing and regulation mm. is the things that government gets to stop you from doing. Um, and so th that's more interesting. I don't see a lot of fighting for Bitcoin rights and I definitely don't see that from the president and very high up people. Um, so to come back to sailors, you know, uh, thinking, I would say in order to judge any type of Bitcoin prediction or advice, you've got to establish what you're optimizing for. And so consider that Sailor is probably optimizing for the price of his Bitcoin. You know what I mean? And most people yeah. are. And that's why you get a lot of kind of weird incentive behavior or contradictory. You know, people say something that doesn't reflect that all they actually, they, they say it because it sounds like the right thing to say, but yes. what they really care about is number go up. Um, what they really care about is, well, if I support Sailor, then Sailor will make my wealth go up as well. Um, and these are like very, you know, some, sometimes subconscious behaviors. So what is Michael Saylor optimizing for in that advice? I don't know. He, he seems to be state aligned and he's already baked into the system. He's have a public company. He has a, a strategic play where he's leveraging the, the situation of that public company to, you know, pump the stock price because it holds Bitcoin. He's got this kind of feedback loop thing and strategy going. So this is probably what he needs for his plan to be optimal. I don't know that. I, I wouldn't want that though. I want, I want, I think people should just not talk to the government when it comes to Bitcoin. Um, I think you should just leave them alone, leave them ignorant. Um, because the idea here is that we're supposed to be able to keep doing whatever the hell they want, even if they try to stop us. So is that true or not? What, what are your thoughts on the, uh, the playbook, the, uh, you know, the, the sailor, you know, the, the sailor playbook. Cause I, uh, okay, look, I can't help but be critical, not of him, okay, but because it doesn't make a difference who comes up with these ideas, if you ask me. It's just, it's an idea and people can either implement it or not. My whole thing is this. I feel like it's going to be a way for companies that do nothing to pretend like they're producing some type of value and that is going to be validated by the fact that if they can tread water and hold Bitcoin long enough through enough cycles, they are going to come across as profitable. And I just, what I'm saying is, I guess I don't have that much faith in necessarily businesses actually trying to produce something of value just because they're holding Bitcoin. I feel like the human condition is laziness for the most part. And they'll just be like, well, what the fuck? We're all, all we got to do is hold Bitcoin and hang on to it. What what are your thoughts on that? Because essentially that to me is the sailor playbook is that these companies put Bitcoin on their balance sheets, which again, totally thrilled that they're buying Bitcoin and, the, and that they're holding it, right? But I just, I don't know if that incentive really plays out the way that people think it will. So fundamentally, I think that just as a business, your job is to create profit, right? Yeah. And when you have surplus, you know, savings or resources, you're supposed to either use your expertise to deploy those resources to make more profit mm -hmm. by scaling, taking risks, innovating, whatever it may be, or paying out dividends to your shareholders. And, you know, thus, you know, just being a machine for making profit that's staying at a certain level or trying to maintain that level or trying to not diminish that level for as long as possible. And you just optimize, you know, until you're done. Um, this is another thing of like turning businesses into speculative kind of investments through this Bitcoin investment. Mm. I just, you know, just from the way I described the first thing, I'm uncomfortable with it, you know, fundamentally, because it's just like, okay, like 
if they have a thousand Bitcoin, why haven't they paid that out as dividends? Why haven't they provided a plan, you know, a, a deck or something that shows how they're going to deploy that capital and become, you know, the biggest company in the world? Like, why haven't they done that? Why isn't MicroStrategy doing that? Uh, you know, while I'm talking to you, I'm actually thinking of Fold the whole time because yeah. they just, <laughs> and that's I didn't right. mention them. That's why I have to mention them now because Fold. That's what I'm thinking of in my head because they're the most recent people to have announced this kind of thing. They said they have a thousand Bitcoin that they're going to try to get 2000. Um, but I haven't heard a lot about fold in the past couple of years. It's possible they've been growing and growing, growing because I don't use the app that much. I, I have it mm -hmm. installed. I have an account, but I just don't use it. I live in Europe and I just, you know, I, yeah. I, I, I'm a bit fish, bit refill shareholder. So I use bit refill um, and bit refill does seem to have grown notably in the recent, in recent years, I think I'm pretty sure that they're a bigger company than fold. Now, I don't think they have a thousand Bitcoin or reserves. Are they doing this kind of play? So, you know, I, it's interesting to see, I'm interested to see what valuation they'll get, how this feedback loop might work for them in contrast to how it works for sailor. They're not as famous as sailor. Maybe they can't get that, that feedback loop going and it just kind of falls flat. I don't know, but in the end, the market will value them at at least the value of the Bitcoin they hold. So that's, that's fair. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, if I were them, I would like, when I started Synonym, I, I kept trying to find a way to be like, hey, like, is there a way that we can have like a treasury of Bitcoin for Synonym like right now? Like just put a million dollars of Bitcoin for Synonym just so I know that like in eight years, two cycles from now, that no matter what happens with Tether, we'll have like that Bitcoin as like yeah. backup. It turns out that this gets pretty complicated and useless because in the end, if Tether owns the company, they Tether is the one that has to have Bitcoin and they have lots of Bitcoin. And so it's just like, it didn't really make any logistic sense to try to do something like this. Um, but yeah, there are also companies in Bitcoin that have done that. Startups that raised, you know, 5 million, 20 million, whatever it may be when Bitcoin was at like $5,000. And they've kind of kept their companies small, kept their companies afloat, innovated very little and kind of just drag out that funding as just kind of like a, a tit job that they have. You know what I mean? I'm not going to name any names because I'm just speculating. But yeah. that this, this Bitcoin appreciation thing is a factor. But... Two big problems here. One, eventually everybody's going to figure out that they should just buy Bitcoin instead, um, and they're going to find they're going to figure this out in ways because the incentives are wrong for this feedback loop for this strategy, because the, what the incentives are are that like you're trying to leverage against the government, you're trying to like take these loans and keep causing a feedback loop, you're trying to leverage how the stock market works and how people use stocks as stores of value instead of ways to speculate on business growth, mm. like you're you're going against what's natural, and eventually the market will come and clear you out, and so that's the problem with gambling is eventually the house wins, and so. This is also related to another big problem I see, which is you have to be really lucky to get out of this feedback loop that you're trying to create before the government stops what you're doing. Because eventually the government is not going to like this. They're going to say, oh, these people are just using the stock market to create their own investment schemes. Um, and they're just using this as a feedback loop for like, I don't know what they'll call it, like a, almost like a Ponzi scheme or something like Ponzi stock usage. I don't know what you call it. Yeah, I know. They'll um, come up with something. <laughs> right. But the problem with Sailor is he's going to have like a bajillion dollars in Bitcoin. It's going to be relatively centrally located or easy to centrally attack. And the government's going to say, hey, you know what? You can't do that anymore. And anybody who did do that has to pay 50% sales tax or has to pay, uh, uh, what do they call it? Unrealized gains tax. Now, if they start We've throwing them unrealized that gains around. Yeah, they're going to start they're going to throw something at him eventually when they stop liking and tolerating what he's doing and mm. he will have to comply because he's aligned with the state. He's dependent on the state. And so that bitcoin is not his until it's his. You know what I mean? Mm. It's not microstrategies because microstrategy is a public company. It's the states. And so people that invest in microstrategy shares, they're investing in like a state speculative instrument, you know what I mean, for mm -hmm. kind of piling Bitcoin onto company value and trying to arbitrage the unknownness of what the company is worth between what the Bitcoin might be worth later. It's, I hope it works for everybody that gets involved because fuck the government, but the government still has all the guns. So 
so are all of these companies just honeypots? <laughs> like, are they all, you know what I mean? Like all these, because there was also Semler Scientific that as well announced, you know, their, you know, the Bitcoin purchase strategy. Then there's Marathon Holdings, right? They announced all of a sudden a uh, million dollars worth, or sorry, a hundred million dollars. The Marathon's worth of- embarrassing, in my opinion. Yeah. It's yeah like, I, I saw, you, I saw like, your oh. tweet. Oh, did I? Say, I don't you, even know if I said something. Was it you it's that said embarrassing? Said, I oh, sorry. Know. Go on. I don't think I said anything yet. No. Okay. <laughs> I guess I just heard about it today. Um, yeah, the Mara thing. Like, I guess they're kind of doing a similar thing where they're going to buy X amount of dollars of Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. Like, dude, like your job is to mine Bitcoin. Mining Bitcoin is a way of buying Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. You're supposed to have an, an asymmetric advantage of buying Bitcoin through mining. <laughs> like, why yeah. would I give you? Like, I, I can buy a Bitcoin myself. I don't need you to buy Bitcoin for me. So let me ask you this, okay? So we've got this week alone, there was the full announcement. They're going public through this SPAC thing, which arguably usually means that they don't have enough money to actually go public or the resources, and that's why they do it in this method. And again, I'm not saying necessarily that that is a bad thing. I'm just I do saying, think that thing yeah. I, 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 this is old memory, but I'm mm. pretty sure SPAC was also created to give smaller businesses like, uh, you know, under 5 million revenue or something, yes. an opportunity to enter the stock market. So I, I think it's an extra thing that it was enabled um, for mm. what it's worth, but yeah. Oh, no, absolutely. I mean, like, that's the that, that's the whole point, right? Is that we, we give like both, you know, multiple sides of the story, right? So, but okay, so we've got, we've got them that did this, okay? Um, and, you know, the CEO, Will, is out on Twitter, obviously actively shilling the shares that are going to, you know, in um, be worth more to the shareholders, right? Um, and then also at the same time, we've got the marathon announcement all of a sudden, right? They So on one hand, they quote unquote bought $100 million worth of Bitcoin. On the other hand, they also um, now have to pay out $138 million in fines. Um and then also, I don't know if you heard the Swan news this week, right? That they had to let go. Like, I again, I could be incorrect about the number, but it was like over seventy-three employees. I've been hearing something a little over fifty percent of of the company, and this was sudden. So all of these three things happened this week. Um, I don't know if you know about all three of them, but do you? I don't know the details of all three. Like, I, yeah, I, I no, know that there were people getting laid. We only off have some Swan. details. I didn't hear any number. Um, I did hear that it was related to their hosted mining efforts. Yeah, that's um, what they said. I don't know if that's the only people they laid off. I don't know. Um, yeah, I haven't you, talked to anybody there. So I did a clip today that I dropped, and you know, my, my title for it was that you know, are these like canaries in 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 the coal mine? What are your? I mean, just. I mean, there's certainly symptoms. I know you don't know the uh, details, but just your your feelings on it. You know. I think there's certainly symptoms, like. Uh, I don't know that they're all related. Um, so no, I don't think they're all related. Coincidence. Yeah. Um, like but I think it's interesting. Miners, like like Swan doing a big layoff right at the cusp of like the second stage the of market. a bull market. Yeah. Seems weird. Um, because it feels like we're about to start running soon. And right. And we've and we've when we recovered very nicely in in this year in general. So it's like, um, yep. seems a little bit weird. It's just possible they made a big strategic mistake. Like they just, yeah. they thought they would be able to do this and they would just, they went in too blind and just had to pull back quickly. That's not unlikely. Um, mm. yeah, with marathon, that is, like I said, embarrassing. I don't, it just seems like, a re- that seems like a red flag. I don't know that I would red flag Swan for sure without more details. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. There's symptoms of something, uh, with the mining one, I would say, Probably miners speculated a little too hard that the bull market would come quicker, or at least that we'd be at a higher price quicker, um, and the hash rate went up too fast. But this is a constant story with mining, right? Like if you don't truly yeah. have a, a, a electricity price advantage or severe hardware price advantage, you're just not going to recoup. No. Um, I always thought the hack with mining was that you could declare your purchases as expenses, and so, like in other words, the the electricity cost to mine a Bitcoin is the purchase cost. So now you can deduct that as an expense in your business, and thus mm-hmm. your now your buying of Bitcoin is expenses. That's what I thought the hack was. Seems like a hack that's pretty easy to leverage if you have scale, but mm-hmm. I could be wrong. I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't really know. I, I don't think I'm not going to say I have some sort of conspiracy theory about what's no. looming. I I don't. Yeah. 
Yeah, I was. I just. I just wanted to know. You know, it's. Uh, I. I also to your Americans point, right? going too hard. You know, that's all it is. Probably <laughs> that's all it is, right? Like that's. <laughs> I was kind of thinking too. Like they were just like over leveraged. Um, but I. I do think to your point though, right? These things happening right at the beginning of a you know of a bull run. You know, kind of like because let's face it, if we've seen previous runs, we come back up to the previous price, kind of hang out there for a little bit, not that long. In all honesty, in this market, we've hung out at these price levels longer than in the previous cycle at its all-time high price levels. So yeah, I think we'll be at new all-time highs. It's levels. interesting. Yeah. I don't think it's going to Like we're building support. Yeah. I figured we'd give some people some hopium here on the, uh, on yeah, the show. Yeah, some hopium. Four to six weeks, guys. <laughs> new all time highs. <laughs> oh, dude. Uh, look, um, it, it's been absolutely awesome to uh, to have you on the show, man. Thank you so much uh, for joining me. But 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 before we uh, before we close out, if uh, you could just let the listeners know uh, where they can find you, where they can find more information about Synonym and Bitkit Wallet, and guys, everything that John is going to say is going to be down in the show notes for you to check out. Great. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, you can find me on Twitter as Bitcoin error log is my handle or X, sorry, X.com on Bitcoin error log. Um, you can find our website at synonym.to, synonym.to. Um, we have the slash tags website is the same thing, slash tags.to, block tank.to, um, bitkit.to. The bitkit website is new. You can go there to download the app. We just came out of uh, beta into a full public release um, at BTC Prog this summer. Um, so please try it out. Give us some, you know, rankings and, and some feedback if you have any. Um, I appreciate any support you you give us, and whether that be uh, appreciating our ideas, using our applications. And I hope uh, you all uh, give me a little bit of your attention in the coming months as we release our new stuff. Um, it's pretty uh risky for us to be doing what we're doing and any support is going to be really helpful to us. Um, so yeah, look, keep an eye out for some announcements before the end of the year and uh, check me out on Twitter and check out our website and pick it. Absolutely awesome. And Pleb Underground is going to retweet that stuff uh, from Synonym and BitKit. Guys, this is going to wrap up this week's episode of Pleb Underground. Don't forget to check us out on our audio only platforms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Anchor. If you want to stream us sats, check us out on fountain.fm. Guys, catch you next week. Peace.